Welcome to the Emancipation Special of Amari Purple Talk, a podcast where I share my thoughts on the Prince musical singularity. I'm Richard Cole, your imagination soloist, and today we are celebrating a Prince album that I feel is a classic, a classic 90s album that should have been as memorable as Prince's 80s classic albums. This is a discussion of Prince's 1996 album, Emancipation. Please leave your comments on the show in the comments below or on my website, www.amaricommunications.com. And you can also follow me on Twitter at Amari underscore now and on Instagram at Richard Cole underscore Amari. Now let's get started. On September 13th, 2019, The Prince Estate, along with Sony Legacy, released three key Prince albums as reissues on CD and vinyl. 1995's The Versace Experience, which I feel was a temporary fix due to The Prince Estate's inability to release the gold experience because of the ongoing lawsuit over the song The Most Beautiful Girl in the World. For more on that, listen to Amari Purple Talk, Episode 3, in which I discuss if we will ever see the gold experience released. You may find a link below to Episode 3 of Amari Purple Talk, and be sure to listen to the segment, The Gold Experience, When Will It Be Released? The other releases from September 13th, 2019, are Prince's 1996 album, Chaos and Disorder, and 1996's Emancipation. In this discussion of the Emancipation album, we are going to first go over key events leading up to the recording and the release of the album, beginning with the 1992 Warner Brothers contract and Prince's later dissatisfaction with it. The name change and how this helped and hindered his career. The release of The Gold Experience and Exodus albums. And the Emancipation discussion and why I think this album should be reevaluated and gain more attention in the generations to come. On August 31st, 1992, Prince signed a new recording contract with Warner Brothers Records. This contract was worth $100 million, uh, which was more than other pop stars such as Madonna or Michael Jackson uh, had received earlier that year, uh, with both Michael and Madonna having an estimated $60 million apiece on their respective uh, record deals with Warner's and with Sony Music. The terms of the contract that Prince signed with Warner Brothers Records guaranteed a $10 million advance per record, plus a royalty rate of around 20%, three times his previous percentage. However, Prince would only get the $10 million in advance if the previous album sold at least 5 million copies. Keep in mind that out of the 13 albums Prince had released up to that point, only three of his albums sold more than 5 million copies. Although one of those was the latest album prior to the contract signing Diamonds and Pearls. Now the advance was regarded as an attempt by Warner Brothers to kind of get Prince to invest some effort into future releases as he had done with Diamonds and Pearls and to slow down his recorded output. An additional $20 million was used to make Paisley Park Records a joint venture with Warner Brothers. This would allow Prince to become more involved with the running of the label, where previously Paisley Park Records would simply supply the master tapes to Warners and then they would manufacture, distribute, and promote the releases. Under the terms of this contract, The label, being Warner Brothers, would decide on what to invest as far as what videos and promotional materials. Warner Brothers and Prince would share investments and profits. And there was also talk of an additional record label as well. 
another $20 million was also advanced, uh, this time to Warner Chapel Music Publishers, part of which was a new three-year agreement between Prince's Music Company, which was Controversy Music, and Warner Chapel for the handling of copyrights worldwide. Another agreement involved Prince and Warner Brothers looking for new talent. This also led to Warner Brothers Records naming Prince a Vice President of Artists and Repertoire and gave him an office at its LA headquarters. There is speculation that Prince only wanted this position in order to acquire Time Warner stock options, but there is no evidence to support that theory. News of this deal was made public on September 4th, 1992. Even though we don't know the specifics of the actual contract or the terms contained within the contract, we do know based on interviews that Prince gave in 1994 and 1995 that he was very dissatisfied with the contract. Among the key points were his ability to work with other artists, as well as uh, promotional ideas such as putting a free CD of guitar music within an issue of a magazine like Guitar Player or Guitar World. But the topic that would resonate the loudest with his dissatisfaction with Warner Brothers in the years 1994 through 1996 was the ownership of his master recordings. A master recording by definition is the first recording of a song or other sound from which all the later copies are made. Master recordings, sometimes called masters, can be made on discs, tapes, and computer data storage formats. A multi-track master is an original multi-track recording which may be worked on over time. Now the ownership of those guarantees you to write to use or release those recordings in any way the owner sees fit. In Prince's own words, these master recordings are an artist's social security. Very few artists retain the control of their master recordings, either through ownership or some type of percentage of say-so in how they are released or distribute it. In short, owning your master recordings, you get to keep creative control and you're free to release your music however you want via whichever channels you choose. Once Prince saw these limitations placed upon him, he made it his mission to become free of this contract at whatever cost. On June 7th, 1993, Prince's 35th birthday, Prince issues a press statement that he is changing his name to a symbol, a symbol that he has been using as his brand for a number of years. He had even begun signing autographs with it and even used the logo in lieu of an actual album title uh, for his 1992 album. In this announcement, he also stated that he would no longer perform his hit songs as they belong to the Prince brand any new recordings would now belong to the symbol. Industry insiders speculated that the deal was a way for Prince to get out of his contract with Warner Brothers Records. But to most of the mainstream media and the mainstream record buying public, this name change to an unpronounceable symbol was just plain crazy, just plain nuts. And despite the fact that without Warner Brothers, he released the Most Beautiful Girl in the World, a song that was top three in the United States and a number one in England, putting on fine performances around the world and still recording great albums such as The Gold Experience. These accomplishments were largely ignored by the mainstream as they were too baffled and too distracted uh, by the name change. I believe that it was this public relations fiasco, as well as the hardball negotiations that were going on between Prince and Warner Brothers, in which two of the biggest factors, the ownership of the master recordings 
and ownership of his publishing, especially the latter item, the ownership of publishing, a contract term that would not expire until a few years after Prince's leaving Warner Brothers Records to go on a path of independence. This is the main item that I feel prevented the album Emancipation, an album which is Prince's equivalent to Stevie Wonder's Songs in the Key of Life or George Harrison's All Things Must Pass as being a significant watershed album for Prince. An album only which diehard fans consider a masterpiece. But before I go into why I feel that the Emancipation album should be reevaluated as a significant work of art, I'm going to explore some of the bumpy recorded trails uh, that led to the recording and the release of Emancipation. A September 1995 article in Variety revealed that Warner Brothers investment in Paisley Park Records wasn't without its conditions. The deal, however, permitted Warner Brothers to recoup the money it gave to Paisley Park out of Prince's own past and future recording revenues. And the deal also gave Paisley Park Records five years to become profitable, while Prince's recording contract with Warner Brothers ran until 1999. Warner Brothers Records is said to have invested more than $25 million, although uh, Prince's camp says it's $100 million that was invested. The joint venture with Paisley Park Records did not yield any successes, despite having legends such as Mavis Staples and George Clinton on the label. Warner Brothers severed its ties with Paisley Park in 1994. By 1995, it was clear that Prince wanted out of Warner Brothers. Despite Warner Brothers allowing Prince to release The Most Beautiful Girl in the World independently, they balked on allowing him to release an entire album on his own. This album was the gold experience, an album he wanted to release under the symbol brand. Warner Brothers also refused to allow him to release the gold experience simultaneously with contractually obligated album Come. Though nowadays everyone from Beyonce to Frank Ocean has had success releasing two different albums the same day. Even Prince later in 2014 under the Warner Brothers released two different albums. It took a year before the gold experience was released. Even though critics and fans felt this was Prince's strongest album since 1987's Sign of the Times, the bad publicity over the name change and lack of promotion by either Prince or Warner Brothers, in addition to the delay of one year, made some of the tracks sound dated, preventing the mainstream from realizing the album's true greatness. But the main objective was to get one more album closer to getting Prince away from Warner Brothers sooner. 1994 saw the release of the highly bootleg Black Album, that with Come, The Gold Experience, the soundtrack of the movie Girl 6, which used a number of classic Prince songs along with a few vault tracks, and 1996's Chaos and Disorder allowed Prince, at least recording-wise, to leave Warner Brothers and record and release future recordings in the manner Prince felt best. The album Emancipation was first mentioned in a 1995 issue of Esquire magazine. The magazine says, for some time he has been working on Emancipation, which will be his first album when he is free. At the time it was speculated to have 50 new songs. The article goes on to say that he will then emerge, he will speak to the press, his face has changed now as though the plastic boss face was to keep everyone else calm. He tells me that his heart and perhaps his best work are in emancipation. Part of the deal to end Prince's recording contract with Warner Brothers, uh, Warner Brothers retained the right to release two compilations. Uh, those two compilations, I believe, were the very best of Prince and then later the Prince Ultimate Collection. Prince also provided Warner Brothers with an album of additional vault material. Uh, that album later became The Vault that was released in 1999. 
Emancipation was released on November 19, 1996 as a joint venture between Prince's NPG Records and EMI Records. Emancipation debuted at number 11 and sold well over 500,000 copies. I enjoy Emancipation as an album and even more so since its re-release. Now I didn't purchase the reissue uh, because there wasn't any extensive remixing or remastering of the album and there were no bonus materials or bonus booklets uh, that would warrant me to purchase it. I still have the original CD. I've been replaying it a lot since uh, the reissue of Emancipation and there are a lot of wonderful songs that are on it. Uh, just about every song on it I do enjoy and like most double, triple album sets, uh, there is going to be some filler. But the concept of the album holds everything together. And it is a concept album. Uh, it's a concept album celebrating his emancipation from Warner Brothers Records. Uh, it's a celebration of his marriage at the time to Maite. Uh, they were married on February 14th of 1996. Uh, they were expecting a child that was born in October, a month before the album was released, uh, but died uh, within a week of Pfeiffer syndrome. Uh, so there was a sort of a bittersweet moment in the celebration of it. So what was to be a very high celebration of life on this album, um, it was kind of brought to a close uh, with the death of their child, Amir. Uh, but as an album celebrating life and freedom, uh, every song holds together on this album. Uh, let's see, I don't have a huge favorite on the album. Um, like I said, as a theme, it's something I can listen to. Um, even the sort of uh, filler songs, there's nuances even in those songs uh, that I enjoy. Starting with uh, disc one, uh, the opener, Jam of the Year, uh, though it's kind of a mellow, kind of like almost a Madhouse style funk groove, um, it's a celebration, definitely a celebration. Uh, it kind of goes into a little soulful, more funkier material with the next two tracks, Right Back Here in My Arms and Somebody Somebody. Uh, two tracks, I know when I first got the CD, that got heavy rotation as I was playing it. Uh, so as far as disc one, that trio of songs that opened disc one, uh, the covers, um, I Can't Make You Love Me and Bet You By Golly Wow, uh, from my understanding was that at the time, Prince was very interested in doing covers, uh, but according to him, Warner Brothers frowned on the idea. So again emancipation celebrating freedom of oppression this was something that he always wanted to do so there are four covers in the entire piece uh, there's betcha by golly wow i can't make you love me one of us and la 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 means i love you so this was a lifelong ambition for prince to attempt to do covers you know there was initial criticism uh, for the album where critics didn't hear a freer sound, meaning that there wasn't a lot of envelope pushing uh, reflective in albums such as Dirty Mind, Controversy, 1999, Purple Rain, etc. Uh, but the to me, the freedom in this album isn't so much as pushing an envelope in regards to trying to come up with a whole new musical style but the freedom to express yourself utilizing various genres. And there's, you know, there's rock here, there's R&B, there's you know, house music, there's hip hop in here a little bit. So to me, just the nuances in some of the songs or ways some of the songs even change gears, uh, case in point on disc two, there's joint to joint, 
where that song changes gears a lot. And then there's disc two, uh, which is probably the most mature, most intimate ballads uh, on the entire disc. Uh, my favorites are Soul Sanctuary, uh, the suite of Curious Child that goes into Dreaming About You. And of course, a joint to joint is funky track, but I like that. Uh, the Holy River is a beautiful song. And then probably the main favorite on this one for me is Friend, Lover, Sister, Mother, Wife. And you also have Disc 3. Maybe not my favorite out of the whole set, uh, but there are great songs. New World, Face Down was a favorite of mine for a long time. For me, hearing him play that live, uh, I enjoy that more. Uh, but as far as the album is concerned, though, it is one of the favorites on Disc 3. In addition to the celebration of life and freedom, uh, there is a heavy Egyptian influence uh, that surrounds the concept, not only just the way the songs are timed perfectly, uh, the packaging of it. As near as I can theorize, I want to go out on a limb and say that this might be be sort of a nod to the way that the pyramids are built in exact alignment with Orion's belt. So that's my theory as far as the relationship. Uh, that, so that kind of lends itself towards a symmetry or harmony of sorts. Uh, the three pyramids of Giza. So you have the three separate discs. So that's my theory as far as the cons, the main, the underlying Egyptian concept of that record. So it's a great album. Uh, I recommend if you don't have it, uh, like I said, it's been reissued. So by all means, seek it out and listen to it and hope you enjoy it as well. It's a Prince classic. It's a mature Prince classic. And I also believe this is his songs in the key of life. This is his All Things Must Pass in relationship to Stevie Wonder and George Harrison. You know, uh, Songs in the Key of Life was a double record set, although it did come with a small, kind of almost 45 looking third disc of bonus material. And George Harrison, uh, All Things Must Pass, uh, was probably one of the most successful triple albums of all time. Uh, and also some of it was uh, spiritual in nature as well. I believe emancipation belongs in that club. I also believe the themes of the celebration of life and the celebration of emancipation. Uh, I think all the songs on this album serve as a sort of a soundtrack or an inspiration. And I know celebration of life and of freedom or something that even today is still needed. Uh, I find that this album has some relevance in my own life still today, you know, uh, more so than when it was first released. Uh, you know, we get older and we face certain challenges, uh, certain impasses, uh, whether it's career or whatever it is. But like I said, an album like this can serve as an inspiration as well. That's my thoughts on the Emancipation album. Uh, I hope that you've enjoyed this and let me know what you guys think. Uh, is this one of your favorite albums? Do you think that it deserves a place in the Prince Pantheon of classic albums? Uh, let me know in the comments below. And thanks once again for tuning in. And don't forget to listen to Amari Purple Talk, which comes at you every Monday on your favorite podcasting platform uh, to submit topics or questions please uh, send them via my website www.amaricommunications.com and you can also find me on twitter at amari underscore now and that will conclude today's emancipation special keep it purple and on the one.